Hi, and welcome to Spaminar. This is the third in our series of online gatherings for live theater prop professionals and anyone interested in stage props. My name's Jim Guy, and I'm the Properties Director at Milwaukee Repertory Theater and President of the Society of Property Artisan Managers. SPAM is an association of professional prop educators and prop managers from not-for-profit producing organizations with an international communication and support network that shares resources, information, solutions and techniques, safety issues, continuing education, and stock. We promote the highest professional standards among prop artisans and craftspersons, as well as promote the profession of props to potential artisans and we work to establish educational standards for the training of prop artisans. SPAM was formed in 1994 to create a fellowship among properties professionals to address issues of common importance and to create parity with other production areas. We now have over 150 members reaching from Hawaii to Ireland and Canada to Florida. As with our last Spaminar, we're requesting a pay what you can donation to help support the programming and our annual grants for early career prop professionals. If you can afford to donate, the link will be in the chat during the session. We truly appreciate any help you can give. Tonight's presentation is Prop Textures 101, demonstrations of using common affordable items to elevate your props to the next level. Our guest presenter is SPAM's very own Ben Homan, Properties Director at Utah Shakespeare Festival. Ben has worked at the festival for the last 27 years, starting out on run crew and as crew supervisor, then as props artisan, prop master, and props director. He also designed scenery for the festival's touring shows and educational programs. Prior to his tenure at Utah, Ben worked at Actors Theatre Louisville for four seasons as a props artisan and co-prop master. Ben also has his own business that provides scenery, props, costumes, and other things for parades, ballets, pageants, and theater productions. Ben clearly does not sit still particularly well. Our moderator is Stephanie Hansen, SPAM member Associate Professor of Theater and Property Supervisor and Resident Scenic Designer for the Resident Ensemble Players at the University of Delaware. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a short Q&A session. So write your questions down there in the chat field and Stephanie will select a few questions from the chat to ask our guests today. Be sure to stay to the end of the session to hear about the great lineup of future spam and our guests and other ways you can interact with our members and learn from them. Okay, enough of that, on to the main event. I am pleased and proud to present my friends and colleagues, 
moderators Stephanie Hansen and our presenter, Ben Homan. Enjoy. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about texture. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, texture creates richness and depth and provides opportunity for highlight and shadow on objects. Um, in my mind, texture comes in one of two forms, uh, subtractive or additive. Subtractive would be things like sandblasting, grinding, um, removing part of the object to give it texture. Additive is the other version, which we're going to talk about tonight. Additive is adding additional layers to an object to create texture. Um, so there are two main types in my mind of additive textures. One is visual. Um, so on fabrics, if you have a pattern to the fabric, that's a visual texture. It's a fairly, it's a 2D texture, but visually it catches your eye. The other is actually physical, a dimensional texture, something you can actually feel, something tactile. Um, so we're going to start out kind of slow and show you some, some really simple basic textures. Um, and then we're going to get into some more advanced like 3D stuff um, in the second half of the, the session. Um, so the first thing that um, I do sometimes is um, I will just spray through a stencil um, to add another layer um, to something. So a couple examples really quick. Um, uh, I have this, this is a piece of metal grating that we had in the shop um, and I sprayed some silver paint through it. Um, onto a piece of fabric um, and my shop lighting is a little terrible, but you can kind of see how it gives a little bit of texture to that. Um, a second example of that is spraying through lace. Um, so both of these were just sort of red um, handkerchiefs that we had. Um, and you can sort of see how much more interesting this is than just a plain piece of red fabric. Okay. so. Um, That'd be a real simple way is just if you have a cheap fabric, you could spray through something to give it a second layer. Um, a couple other things that we do a lot here at the festival. Um, we're going to go through five or six really quick um, sort of simple textures. The first one is what I call tissue paper light. So I'm just using some, some pieces of plywood that I cut um, as my base. Um, and I'm using, this is going to be um, a white glue. Um, so any kind of white glue. Um, mixed about 50-50 with water. It's not science at all. Um, so it's just kind of roughly 50-50. Um, you want to stir it up really well and you want to stir it as you're using it um, so that it doesn't separate out. Um, you basically wet your surface and this could be a prop. It could be a piece of scenery, whatever. But you want to get some glue on the surface and then you want to take a piece of tissue paper and crumple it up and then uncrumple it. This is very, very scientific. Um, and then you want to sort of squish it down onto your wet surface. Um, and you want to get it really stuck down. So the reason this is called tissue paper light is you're not adding a lot of texture. You want the tissue paper to be fairly flat. Um, here, I can, my shop lighting is terrible. So you want it to be fairly flat. Um, and you want to brush over it a little bit. The one thing you want to be careful of with the tissue paper is if you get it too wet and you work it too much, you'll start to rip it because it will get super, super soft. Um, so you just want to keep working that, um, get it glued down really well, and you're going to set it aside to dry. Um, and we'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. Okay. Uh, the second version is very similar. It is called tissue paper heavy. And I've already done some of that. So tissue paper heavy, I think of more like bark on a tree. So you're going to want to gather your tissue paper once you've crushed it up. Ooh, that one's very dusty. Um, you're not going to want to um, stick it down quite as well. So again, you're going to wet your surface and then you're going to squish down your tissue paper, but leave it much more dimensional. And as you start to glue, you want to do more of sort of a tapping until it starts to stick down so that you get higher ridges. Now, again, you want to make it stick all the way down. Otherwise, um, when you go to do more work to it, if there's a lot of air pockets underneath, um, those are going to want to like sort of pop and rip and cause you all kinds of headaches. You want to make sure you get it sucked down really well. Um, so this may take a little more working with the glue um, and stuff, but you want a heavy, a heavier texture to that. Um, okay, awesome. Um, the so those are our tissue paper versions. Um, the next thing we use a lot of is textured wallpaper, and textured wallpaper comes. In in all kinds now. This is like a bamboo. Um, so it's got like just a woven feel to it, um, which is really nice. Um, but there's also a whole bunch of um, 
all kinds of different textures. So this is kind of an octagon with some um, relief here in the middle. Um, and this, again, I would apply the same way. Put down a layer of glue, stick this down. Now this you don't have to coat over the top because the glue is not gonna soak through this. Um, but you wanna make sure you get it stuck down really well um, to your subsurface um, before you do the, the later steps of painting and stuff. And we're gonna get to all the painting and how you sort of pop all this texture out um, as we go. Um, another one we do a lot of here is lace. So I, um, this one I've already sort of pre-made. So this is a floral lace. Um, can you see it? There we go. Um, a floral lace that again, white glue on the board, put the lace down, a coat of um, white glue over the top to um, stick it down really well. Um, and then again, you have to let it dry and then you'll come back and do your next process um, once it's dry. Um, and then another one that we do quite a bit here is um, sawdust or sand, depending on the kind of roughness that you want. You gotta be careful with sand that is not so rough that it wants to um, cut or hurt uh, the actor um, if they have to rub against it. So, um, and we save almost all of our sawdust. Um, we have actually giant 50 gallon drums of sawdust. We have really fine sawdust that comes out of the table saw. And then we have um, more flaky sawdust that we save that comes out of our planer. Um, and we keep those separated. Sometimes we'll mix them together um, to create um, uh, sort of a mixed texture. And again, um, that I typically don't use the glue for. Um, that I would generally sort of mix into the paint and just sort of brush on um, or put some paint down, drop some sawdust down, let it set a little bit, and then put a second layer of paint over the top to kind of mix that in. Um, and when we get to the, actually, I can show you what that looks like. Um, I painted all my boards really bright colors. Um, so that when we do the highlight and shadow uh, toward the end, you'll see, but you can see this has some really heavy texture on this side and I went a little lighter on this side. Um, but you can see how that, um, when the light hits it, um, how much texture that gives you. And that's really what we're after is if you think about, you know, a 60 watt light bulb shining on something, it creates a little bit of highlight and shadow. You think about how much light a lighting designer puts on stage uh, and how much that washes out all of that detail. Um, and so we're trying to find ways to sort of pop that detail um, and make it more prevalent. So by putting the texture on the object first, that helps us. And then we can highlight and shadow with paint um, to, to pop those things um, when we need to. Um, one last thing we do a lot of here is, is foil. Um, so we do a lot of gold leafing um, and we use imitation gold leaf. Um, but sometimes that can be really expensive. A couple of years ago, we did a show that had an entire proscenium uh, that was wanted to be gold leafed and it was too expensive. So we did some research and for food service, um, they make these awesome, these are for baked potatoes. Um, so it comes in a little box, they're pre-cut, they're nine by 10 and three quarters. Um, they come in a couple different shades of gold. Um, and we just, um, uh, we worked on this outside. We did spray adhesive and then the foil. You could also use gl uh, glue and the foil. Um, we use aluminum foil sometimes as well. Um, you can crush it up, again, to create that sort of uh, crushed texture a little bit. Um, foil also comes for, for floral purposes and gift purposes. It comes in all kinds of colors. So we have green, we have some purple in the drawer over there, um, that kind of stuff. Um, so foil is really awesome. I think I have, yeah, this is a, um, this was on the portal. We had sort of a, a freeze in the middle that a comedy and tragedy mask. And this is just a paper mache mask. It's had a little damage here over the years, but this is um, just covered in aluminum foil. So instead of uh, spending the money on uh, gilding, um, which can be really expensive, um, a box of this, it's 200 sheets, is probably, I wanna say like four or $5. Um, so really an inexpensive way to create a really nice um, visual texture and a metallic look without spending a lot of money. Um, awesome. Um, so I think at this point, uh, my assistant Patrick um, is going to play a video. Um, we have a couple of videos tonight. Uh, this first one, um, there's two little pieces of furniture I want to show you. Uh, the first one is these two chairs. So these are identical chairs. They've been used in two different shows. So the one on the left um, is just stained um, and was in a more um, uh, stately show. The other one, we have gilded a lot of the detail and you can see how much it sort of pops out. This is a throne. Oh, this is a throne that we built for Camelot. And we actually used textured wallpaper, cut it into strips for the arms um, and then gilded that. 
And then for the back, we actually did tissue paper light because it was a really huge panel and it gave it just enough of a visual interest that it wasn't just a gold panel. Um, so there's two quick examples of kind of how we use this stuff on our props every day here at the festival. Um, awesome. Okay. Now, the fun stuff, more advanced texture. So my assistant hates when she's reading an, an article in a magazine or something, like a, a how-to uh, article, and it says, oh, I just happened to find this amazing vintage uh, bed spring, and I put it on my wall, and I use it to put post-it notes on and, and photos and things like that. Um, she hates that. So what I'm telling you is you don't need to use the products that I'm using. You can find whatever you want. We go all over the place. We go to dollar stores, we go to thrift stores, we go to yard sales and we buy random crap all the time. I actually have a box of random crap I'm gonna dump on the table. Um, we have an entire 40 foot shipping container sitting outside of our shop full of all kinds of stuff that we use for texture. So paper lace doilies, uh, cheesecloth. This is called haunted fabric at Halloween. This is just cheesecloth that's been dyed and then washed. Um, uh, lace, trims, all kinds of gimps. Um, we have some cardboard, um, pressed cardboard decorations. These actually used to be sold by a company. The company doesn't exist anymore. This is used on German coffins. Um, and it comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Um, we have a bunch of that left. We got beads. Um, we have little metal findings. Um, this one's probably from King's Architectural Metals. Um, we have some resin pieces that we've cast out of a mold. This is a little toy that we got from the dollar store. And I'll show you how this was used in a little bit. Um, some plastic uh, candle pieces from uh, um, a huge online person. Uh, I won't say their name. Um, this is how it looked when it first came to us, just super bright and shiny. We spray painted them black, oops, spray painted them black um, and then dusted them with gold. We made a set of 10 matching candelabras uh, for a production and uh, we didn't have a lot of money. So we had to sort of improvise with pieces and parts. Um, what else do we have in here? Um, buttons. Uh, this is um, another, some, some decorative lace. Um, we do a lot of lace and fabric things. And if you just dip them in glue, are like 50-50 white glue and water, um, and then lay them on wax paper till they dry, they become super stiff. Um, and it allows you to apply them a lot easier than trying to deal with the floppy, the floppy fabric. Um, here's a piece of um, woven um, uh, ribbon that we dipped in glue and then dried and then painted gold. Um, so we'll use just about anything. This is a little cake decoration. I mean, just whatever, um, which is awesome. Um, so how we then use that stuff. So this is a really small piece of bamboo. This is just a small sample. Um, this is a cardboard tube that we then took um, twine and glued two pieces of twine to the bamboo to create kind of that little ridge. Um, and then it's covered in masking tape, um, just strips of masking tape that gives us a little bit of that creasing in the bark. Um, and then and we made huge poles for production um, out of this. Um, and it looks like bamboo. Um, we actually slid it over a metal framework um, because buying bamboo that big was really not uh, cost effective, um, but a really simple way to do bamboo. Um, another example is this guy, this was in the intro. So we had to make a scroll case uh, for a production of Pericles. Um, and so this is a brass flower pot, a brass bowl that we cut a hole in. These are cardboard tubes here on the outside. Actually, they might be PVC. It's not like PVC. Um, and then on the top here, this is a little army soldier. Um, this is a cowboy and an Indian. Uh, this is a little monkey. This is a chess piece from a production of The Tempest. Um, and this here on the top where the scroll comes out, this is actually Princess Peach. Um, uh, we bought all this stuff at a, at a thrift store, um, painted it all up um, to make it look old. And then we had the scroll inside um, for the scene. So again, just finding cool, fun things um, and figuring out how to add them to something is, is the name of the game. Um, one more example before we start showing you kind of a process here is we built a giant wardrobe a couple years back um, and the designer, the research had all of these carved panels. I think there was 16 carved panels on the front and then uh, 
eight carved panels on each side. So 32 carved panels total. And I looked to the designer and I said, that's great. We can't spend the time doing that. So here are two of the panels. We didn't save, I saved one door. Uh, we didn't save the whole thing, but this is one of the panels. Um, this is a piece of Luan with some molding. This is a found object. It's a, it's a, a flat sculpture of a woman. And then all of this decoration here is actually masking tape that we crunched up and then hot glued down to create these sort of these uh, coils here. Um, another panel from that is, um, is this panel here. Um, again, we have some masking tape happening. Uh, we have some little hot glue dabs. This is a paper plate, like a dessert plate with some hot glue on it to create the texture. This is a quart paint can lid. And then this is um, a drawer pull uh, backing plate. Um, we had enough of those that matched for the panels that he wanted to do this way. So, and then we um, sort of did a, a sponge stain technique on it to match because the frame of the doors was actually all stained um, wood. So this sort of blended all together and made that happen. So all of these are objects you can find uh, easily at box stores or uh, dollar stores or places like that. And that's, that's the point of all of this is all of this is stuff that you can find easily, locally, no matter where you are. I'm in a really small town here um, and, and, and sort of take all those things um, to the next level. Um, so for a show, I think last year, so I can get all this over here, um, we needed to make a decorative tin box, um, a, a jewelry box. Um, and so a couple of years ago, we did a production that required a whole bunch of army ration tins. Um, and so we found these um, at a local craft store and bought them. And I have a ton of these and we're not gonna need, I must have 50 of these. So um, so I took a couple of these um, and I glued on, I started gluing on, we're just gonna finish right now, um, some decorative items. So we have a button, we have some cake decorations here, a couple of leftover resin castings and some beads. Um, and then this is a little brass um, curtain pool that I snipped the top off of. Um, we looked at a couple years ago and a, a lady um, locally in Las Vegas um, bought a building um, and was gonna flip it and turn it into an art gallery. And when she went in, she found out that um, it was completely full. It was an old curtain manufacturing plant. Um, and it was completely full of trim, fabric trims um, and window shade material and blinds and all kinds of stuff. So I've finished the beading here on this side. Um, and she called us and asked if we wanted any of it. So she donated, I must have 300 or 400 little brass um, poles for um, window shades um, that we, again, just use all the time. Um, and we, if we need something decorative, we'll buy three times as many as we need. Um, and, uh, and then we'll, um, have them for the next time we need them. Um, so there's the idea for the tin. And then through the magic of theater, boop, here it is, all painted red. Um, and in a little bit, we will actually do some highlight and shadow on this to make sure that we're popping all this detail out. Um, get rid of some of this stuff. Um, cool. Okay, um, I think Patrick, we are ready. I'm talking way too fast. We are ready for video number two. Um, so we built a stove um, for Diary of Anne Frank. So we used a brass plate and we cut it out for the door. And we also used it um, across the top for a decorative element on the surface. We then added some textured wallpaper down the sides um, and some wood carvings right above the door and found a really cool knob. So the whole uh, stove itself is made out of plywood um, and then textured. This is a giant four foot grandfather or cuckoo clock. Um, the bag we actually sewed out of felt. Um, the rabbit and the, the bird on the other side are actually foam that we carved. Um, the guns are plastic guns from, from a box store. And the decorative leaf stuff at the top is um, a uh, 70s wall art from someone's like living room that we absconded with. Um, the deer head was a, a resin deer head um, from another, um, another box store. Um, and we just sort of combine all those items. And then when you paint them and bring them all together into the world, then it looks like it's a piece. Um, 
Uh, this actually functioned. It had a duck that popped out and quacked. Um, it actually is a functioning clock. It actually is hanging in our shop um, and is used as a, our shop clock. Um, uh, the duck is removed because it won't fit because of the wall behind. Um, but you can see that it's really just, you know, it was a plywood box and we just added a whole bunch of what I call gack or frou-frou to it um, to give it all that detail and texture. Um, awesome. Okay, so now you've done all of that texture work. Let me unplug my hot glue gun and get it out of the way. Um, now you've done all the texture work, you have all the texture, and now you want to make sure that you can see it. This is where the real artistry part of this all comes in. Okay, so we're going to play with our plywood panels uh, that we made at the beginning and also some other three dimensional things. I have a little uh, medallion here. That one's wood. This is a foam medallion. Um, this is a plastic angel Christmas decoration, half of which I've already aged and half of which is painted gold. Um, and the thing about this is you can have fun with this and do as much or as little as you want. The thing to think about uh, that I always tell people when they start doing this is you don't want to highlight and shadow everything on stage, uh, especially not to the same degree. Um, if, if a prop is really important, it probably wants to have more detail put into it, more work put into it, so it pops on stage. Um, if everything was highlighted and shadowed um, and you turned the lights on, you wouldn't know where to look. So you can use these techniques also help direct the, the audience's eye to the things that you want them to notice on stage. Uh, so that being said, um, a couple of products that we use a lot, um, oh, we use a lot of glazes. Um, there's two that we really love. One is, um, this, is a, this is a Valspar product, but it's called Asphaltum and it's an antiquing glaze um, and it's kind of a black. Um, and then this is a Rust-Oleum, it's called Transformations Decorative Glaze, and this one is Java Brown. Um, this is actually made for um, distressing your kitchen cabinets. They don't look brand new, um, uh, which I find really funny. We steal from all these different industries. Um, these are both glazes, which means that the base is translucent instead of opaque, um, which allows for your base color to show through much easier. Um, uh, I also have some white paint here. It's actually slightly off-white. Um, and I have two different shades of gold. Um, you don't have to use black and white. Um, you can use um, uh, shades of the, the color that you're working with if you want it to be more subtle, um, those kind of things. So again, this is kind of where a little bit of experimentation and play um, is really helpful. Uh, you want to have some paint brushes around. You want to have some rags for wiping off. Um, and um, you can start experimenting. So in the Java, I have both straight Java right out of the can. And I also, because these are all water-based, I also have a 50-50 mix that's um, thinned down quite a bit. Um, sorry, let me get this open here. Um, and I'm gonna start with this guy right here. So here it is, un untouched. And I'm gonna go with the, the full strength Java. And I just coat the whole thing and you wanna make sure you get it down into all the texture because that's what we're trying to sort of show off here and point out. And I'm not gonna do the whole thing because I need to be able to hold on to it. Um, and then you can let it sit for a while or you can wipe it off immediately. And again, how much you wipe it off shows how much the texture is gonna read, okay? So if, and once you let it dry, if you feel like it's not deep enough into some of those pores, you could come back and do a second coat. Um, so there's how it reads once it has some of that Java on it. Okay, sorry, my camera angle and my shop light are not working together super well. Um, and then we're gonna go to the 50-50 here um, and do this one. Um, so this is a little runnier and you could probably, if I tip it, it'll probably run off. Um, we also use the, um, this watered down, both this and the asphalt and watered down to do a lot of sort of um, weathering on things. So once we sort of get it to the level one that's been outside, we're building some tombstones right now for a show for next year. Um, and um, uh, we're just sort of dripping it across the top and letting it sort of run down um, the surface. So I'm just gonna dab at this so that it sort of builds up a lot in all those crevices. Um, and you can see how much more interesting that is 
um, than just the plain painted surface, okay? Um, works the same um, on our different um, plywood surfaces. So this is tissue paper light. And I'm gonna go in with the, the watered down. I'm just gonna do like a quarter of it here. Um, and again, uh, multiple coats. The, the amazing thing about paint, I'm a, I'm a terrible painter and I, I hate painting, but the one thing about painting that I love is if you mess it up, it's pretty easy to fix it. You know, if you sew a seam wrong or you cut the, the wood the wrong length, um, it's real challenging to just kind of, you know, fix that without having to start over. If this doesn't turn out the way I want it to look, I can just paint it blue again and start over. Um, so again, I'm wiping it off and you can sort of see, let's see here, there we go, how it's sort of catching in all those little creases of the, the tissue paper. And so it gives you a little bit of shadow play there. Um, it works really well on the wallpaper. So the, I painted the wallpaper green. Um, again, I'm just gonna do a quarter of it. And again, you wanna get the paint really down in there if it's the shadow color so that it's really, um, when you wipe it off, the stuff that's down in those lower levels is going to read um, and stay there. All right, because right, we're getting a little wet here. Okay. I'm gonna do two, I'm gonna wipe off a whole bunch on part of it and then much less on the other part. So you can kind of see, it's also super shiny at the moment, but it's, it's popping all of that um, texture out so you can see it so much better. I'm gonna let these dry a little bit and we're gonna come back and highlight them a little bit too as we go. Um, and then the lace, um, I uh, will do a little bit of the dark on the lace as well. And because the lace is actually sort of two levels, it's the lace and the base level, um, it just pops. And I, this orange color is also kind of fun. Um, I hope if you have questions, um, you're putting them in the chat because we'll get to that in a little bit here. Um, okay. And the other thing about the lace is if you don't use too much glue, like the fabric will also take on some of that color. So yeah, I kind of done a reverse here because the lace has actually sucked up the stain, uh, the glaze and the yellow orangey base is sort of coming through on that lower level. So um, lots of different ways to do things. So on our tin here, I'm gonna go with the thicker. Um, And you can decide how, how much you want to put on or how little. Um, just have fun with it. Sound like Bob Ross all of a sudden. Um, so is it an old tin? Have they dug it up out of the dirt? Is it a fairly new tin? I mean, there's all kinds of, what's the story behind the prop? And how is what you're doing to it going to help sell that story to the audience and to the actors? You want it to, to read for the actors as well. So you can see a little bit, my lighting is terrible. You can see how this corner has some highlighting and shadow or some shadowing in there. Um, okay, now we're gonna do some highlighting. Um, so I have, my, and my white paint is fairly thick because it's, it's basically kind of a dry brush is kind of what you're doing. Um, so we're gonna pick the other side of this here and just lightly, and again, if you do too much, you can always come back and uh, repaint it and start over. Um, so that's, there we go. That's kind of popping there a little bit. Um, uh, and on the lace, same thing. And you could, you could do this with water. Um, let's see if you do it over here. I used to do this with sitting down. Okay. You see how it's kind of catching all those ridges and popping them. Um, camera angle is not great for this. Sawdust. Okay. Um, and 
beyond that, beyond just, you know, the highlight and shadow using either black and white or the colors, um, you can also do gold, metallics. Um, you can do gold leafing. This, this little medallion here, the four leaves, um, we've done with gold leaf. Um, so they really pop in our metallic. We have some gold paint here um, that you could um, brush on here and catch the highlights on this medallion. And you can decide, like the gold was on here a long, long time ago and then um, it got aged and distressed. So I put the gold on, I let the gold dry and then I come back and do some aging on it or I could age it first and then put the gold on. So it's, again, it's about the story of the prop and how the highlight and shadow that you're adding to it is gonna help tell and sell that story um, to the audience. Um, uh, also, we do a lot of, so we do a decent amount of gilding. Um, we also do a decent amount of um, gilder's paste or rub and buff. So it comes in a couple different uh, brands. Rub and buff um, uh, is a Amico, American Art Clay Company product. Um, and this is gilder's paste by Baroque Art. They come in tons of colors. And basically how this works, wait, this one's silver, I thought it was gold. Um, what can I do this on so it will read? Maybe it's a sting. Um, so this is basically um, a colored wax. Um, so you, um, I would recommend gloves, but I didn't grab any, so I'm just gonna use my finger. So you get some on your finger and then you sort of rub it on the areas that you wanna highlight. And then you let it sit for a little bit and it will dry. And then you can buff it with a cloth and it will get nice and shiny. Um, let me see if I find something else that I can I'm gonna do it to this horse. Um, I'm gonna do it to this horse with the gold. Um, so this horse is actually a, kind of a funny story. Um, we were doing guys and dolls. And for the scene um, with the three guys getting their shoes polished, the designer found this antique um, cast iron footrest um, of a horse um, on eBay. And he's like, I want six of these for the three shoe shine stands. Um, and this was like $45 and there was only one of them. Um, so I was like, well, that's great. So we bought the one, so we had it as an example. Um, this is a little piece of welded plate steel, piece of pencil rod, another piece of plate steel here on the top. Um, and this is a plastic horse from a box store. And we drilled a hole, slid it on before we welded the top on. We were able to make six of these. So we had that horse look because it is the, the scene where they're talking about the horse race, uh, the race horses. Um, but we weren't spending a ton of money um, and trying to find six of these that match. Um, so anyway, um, oh, this gold is hard as a rock. Make sure you put your, make sure you put your lid on all the way. Okay, we'll do silver. We're gonna do it on the main here. So you can see how it's, it's catching, there it is. How it's catching the individual hairs. Um, you can highlight the ears and the snout, and his feet here. And starts to pop all those details. Um, so that when it's on stage, you know, under light, it'll catch those details and it will look, have more detail to it, um, rather than just being a big black horsey blob at the bottom of the, the thing. Um, uh, Couple other examples. So that's kind of the basics. That's kind of what I was kind of showing is um, creating the textures, uh, a flatter textures like the tissue paper or the wallpaper or the, or the lace, um, or going with more dimensional textures um, like the foam appliques or the decorative stuff you find at, at dollar stores or thrift stores or things like that. Um, how to apply them to objects uh, and then uh, highlighting and shadowing them uh, based on the story of the prop. Okay, now we do this a lot in all kinds of different ways. You've seen the clock, you've seen other things, um, big and small things. This is an orb. Um, we do a lot of Shakespeare plays. So we have a lot of kings who have to carry orbs. This is a styrofoam ball covered with tissue paper light, strings of beads glued on, uh, strings of beads this way. The cross is actually two crocheted crosses. We found at a local a craft store, dipped them in white glue, let them dry, uh, glued them together to give them some dimension. Um, and then uh, gilded the whole thing 
uh, and then have aged and distressed it down um, with several layers of paint and then come back in with the pearls and the red and the gold jewels. Um, and super up close, um, it's a little like, oh, really? But on stage, it reads and looks really good. Um, another example, um, it's my friend Wilbur here. Um, so this is a, a taxidermy pig head form. We covered it with terry cloth. So this is pink terry cloth um, that we glued onto the form. We then took a layer of white glue and water and brushed it over the whole surface to make the, the sort of the raised fuzzy parts stiff. Then we dry brushed it with um, some watered down asphaltum to give it sort of that hair texture. Um, and again, super up close. Um, it, looks, it looks really good, but from far away, it looks, looks pretty astounding. Um, so um, we've done a couple of animals now using um, either terry cloth or we did a porcupine a couple years ago and bought like this really long fur uh, from the craft store um, and sort of ran glue and paint to it with our fingers to make the hair kind of all matted and textured. And then we used lollipop sticks to create the quills. Um, so, um, you know, anything. Um, we got about four minutes left. So we'll do a, this is a staff. This is a Mad Queen, Queen Margaret from Richard III. Um, this is just a wood dowel uh, covered in, we wrapped it first in some lace. We then came back with some jewels. Um, there's some buttons on here. Um, there's some little uh, foam cutouts, um, some, some beads, random bead uh, pieces. Um, the top here has um, some dangly bits hanging off of it. Painted the whole thing gold. Um, and then oh, there's some seashells. There's a little seashell right there. Um, uh, and then uh, came back and did a little bit of highlight and shadow on it. Um, and again, up close, it just, it's just a cacophony. It's a cacophony of mess. Um, but on stage, it just catches so much light because there are so many surfaces um, that it, it never looks boring. Um, and that's always my concern with the props is you never want them to look uh, boring. You don't want them to draw focus. So it can be a challenge to find out that balance of um, uh, too much and too little. And so you have to experiment a little bit. Um, sometimes you go too far, again, it's paint. A lot of times you can pull back, do less. Um, another great one, I have three sticks here actually, we'll go through this. Oops. Sorry, I bumped the table. Um, this is a pool cue uh, from here down is a pool cue. So it has a nice taper to it. Um, and then we cut out layers of felt um, and built that up and glued each layer of felt. So that made that stiff and hard. Um, and then um, the top here was a piece of uh, wood dowel. We added layers to to create this sort of head form to it. Um, uh, and I don't, remember, I don't remember what show this is. This is over 20 years ago. Now, but it's also a really awesome um, uh, staff because it also uh, has a dagger inside of it. Um, but um, just a pool cue and some, some felt, um, great texture. And the last one is actually just a visual texture back to kind of what we started talking about. Um, so this is a stick we found in the local creek bed. Um, and this is a Prospero magic staff. And this particular, um, Tempest we were working on, the designs were all based on uh, drawings of Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and so one of our artisans sat with two colors of Sharpie and drew Leonardo drawings and uh, his Latin backwards um, quotes and stuff from all of his notebooks um, onto the staff. Um, and then uh, we actually, and so this is sort of the middle of the staff that has this leather wrapping on it. Uh, we actually created two of these um, and the second one actually broke. We uh, pre-broke it and drilled a hole and put a golf pencil inside. So when they snapped it over his leg, we got a good snap with the golf pencil. Um, but we didn't have to make one of these for every performance because it took her probably two days of just sitting, doing all of this drawing. Um, but again, from off stage, you can't see all that detail. The detail is mostly there for the actor, um, but you can tell that there's a lot of visual interest to this particular uh, staff. Um, uh, I go on and on. We also do a lot of, um, we have two plastic frames. Um, these are just plastic. This one's black. I think these came from Walmart. Oh, we also got some from Ikea last year. Uh, just a simple black frame. And then we dry brushed it with gold, sort of pop all that detail. 
um, and give it a nice visual interest to it. Um, and then these are from Ikea, they're a little bigger. Um, and these we did, we painted gold, did a little bit of gold leafing on them, uh, then did amber shellac, and then came back with a little bit of the, the Java glaze in a couple areas to give them a little more depth. These were for a production of Hamlet that we did recently. So as you can see, um, it's tons of just fun, play, um, grab some materials, start throwing them on a surface um, and, uh, and see what happens. Um, there's, you can't do it wrong. Um, you might have to do it again if the designer doesn't like it. Um, but um, there are so many different materials out there, mostly inexpensive, that allow you to really sort of pop those props um, up to the next level. Um, like this picture frame has hot glue, lace, um, and then a lot of aging and distressing on it. Um, but to buy a picture frame that has this much detail on it would be $100, $200. We built this frame for about $35. So, uh, yeah, and I think we're about at time for Q and A. Is that true? Are Stephanie? you ready? Are you sure. ready? Yeah. All right. Um, our first question is in regards to the tissue paper uh, technique you're using. I'm wondering if you ever just use paint as the adhesive, or is there is it more important to keep the glue for strength? Um, I, I generally start with a layer of glue because the the paint is so much thicker that the tissue paper will often tear a lot if you just go right into the paint. So I typically do the glue first to get the paper glued down really well. Um, and then the paint won't, won't um, sort of melt. It can melt the tissue paper. Um, so I do glue first. You don't have to, that's just the way it, I've always kind of done it and found it to be really effective. All right. Um, there's a couple of questions about hot glue. One is, do you have a favorite brand or type? Um, no. Um, uh, I don't. Um, we use, I don't, we buy it in bulk. We buy like 30 pounds at a time. Um, and I think it's a fairly generic, um, the clearer the better. Um, I think we try to get the clear instead of the, like the milky. So it doesn't show as much, but I don't have a specific brand. And do you have a favorite way to remove all those glue strings? Um, oftentimes if you, if you have a bunch of them, if you get your fingers wet, um, that tends to help grab them. Um, or I have found um, uh, the, the rag, the microfiber rags, because they have like the hairs that sort of grab onto things. They tend, if you drag that over a surface, they'll tend to grab a lot of them and sort of pull them uh, out where you can grab a hold of them and pull them off. So those two things, uh, the microfiber rag um, and water on your hands are two things that I've found that work pretty well to get rid of the strings. Also, if you just, if you sort of stop, hold for a second, and then pull your gun away, you don't get as many strings. It's like, it's like moving too quickly creates the strings most of the time. All right. Um, when you were doing the oversprays on the lace, there was a question about the brand or type of paint that is best and holds up best on the fabric. And if it, if, 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 if because it's so thin, does it not matter? Um, I just use generic spray paint. We typically buy the cheapest um, spray paint unless we're doing dealing with plastic or floral, in which case we'll go to Design Master or the like the Fusion for plastic. But otherwise, um, we're buying so much spray paint all the time that we'll just buy like a case of gold, a case of black, and like whatever the generic cheap version is at the local uh, hardware store. Um, and it seems to hold up uh, without any issue. And does that also hold, because there's another question about the type of paint on top of the hot glue and if it's handled a lot, if it holds up to use? Um, I've never really had huge issues with the paint coming off. We do seal most of our stuff. One of our theaters is outdoors, so we do do a decent amount of sealing on uh, the surfaces. Um, but I haven't really had much where it's rubbed off. Uh, gilding rubs off more than anything. This trunk sitting behind me was built for production of Merchant of Venice. It was completely gilded. Um, and it was about almost 20 years ago now. Um, and some of the felt and those layers are coming through because the gilding has worn off. Um, so I've had more issues with gilding coming off than, than paint or uh, things like that. And there's a question about what kind of sealer that you're using for those purposes. Um, so uh, we try to use mostly water-based. So we're using a lot of polyacrylic um, is, our, is our main sealer. Uh, the painters use something a lot more intense on the floor uh, and the stairs and stuff. But um, most of our stuff, uh, we're using just polyacrylic. Um, we'll do two coats if it's an outdoor uh, item and just a single coat if it's for an indoor show. 
Um, yeah, next question is about whether or not you can mix pigment into the glazes that you're using, and if so, what type? Um, I think you can. Um, you would just want to use a, a straight pigment. So we used to have a brand here, and we stopped. We just we don't do a lot of mixing of our own paint anymore. Um, I will try to remember and put it um, send it out on on the Facebook. Um, but yes, you can. Um, actually, it's kind of nice. Both. A lot of the larger box chains like Home Depot and Lowe's now, they have glaze um, brands and you can go and actually have them mix up glaze in almost any color, uh, which is actually pretty cool. Um, so if you need a specific color, you could do it that way. But yes, you could mix, if you mix, you can mix paint in, just mix it a very little because it goes a long way. Or you could do straight pigment. And I just don't remember the name of the, the brand of pigment that we had that we used for a long time, but I'll find out. And I believe we are at the end of our questions. Awesome. Um, cool. Well, thanks everybody for attending this. Um, it was fun to kind of show some of this stuff. Um, and yeah, I guess we turn it back over to Mr. Guy. Well, thank you, Stephanie. And thanks, Ben. That was, that was really fun. Very interesting. Very useful. All right, folks, grab your Sharpies, mark your calendars. It's coming attractions time. Closing out 2020 on Sunday, December 20th, will be SPAM member Jen McClure, Yale Repertory Theater Prop Supervisor and Lecturer at the Yale School of Drama with a mold making and planning workshop, a session in which many of you expressed interest in your post spam our surveys. So take the survey, we'll be sending it out afterwards it works and we want to hear from you. Looking into next year, and we do believe that there will be one, on January 17th, 2021, three days before Inauguration Day, our presenter will be SPAM member Larry Heyman, Associate Professor of Properties Design and Fabrication and Lecturer in Theater Design and Production at the Oklahoma City University School of Theater. Larry's a veteran of TV and film prop work, and he'll talk to us about prop adjacent careers in film, television, and related trades. We have several more Spaminars in the works for next year, as you read in the introduction, so stay tuned. You can find us on Facebook at Props for the Stage and Beyond, powered by Spam, and with any luck at all, next year you'll see us live and in person at the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festivals. Also, be sure to drop by online at the all virtual 2021 USITT conference. Spaminar is produced by the Society of Properties Artists and Managers with special thanks to the SPAM Education, Publicity and Finance Committees. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next month. Now go wash your damn hands, put on your masks, stay safe and sanish. For those of the, you in the US, thanks for voting and have a lovely Thanksgiving. Prop on.